Hello everybody, my name is Michael Arkey. I'm the curator of code here at Infotex and your moderator. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them as you see pictured here. We will make sure they get answered. We'd like to point out destinations on our website, webinars.infotex.com, where you can find our upcoming webinar topics and event schedule. And then also movies.infotex.com, where you can find the movies of these webinars and training videos. We welcome your feedback and would love to hear how we are doing or topics you wish for us to cover. Please fill out our quick evaluation or drop us an email. And now for some legal disclaimers. Lene? When you view an Infotex webinar or movie, you do so with four caveats. First, you're agreeing to the terms posted at the web page listed on this slide. Second, our lawyers want you to know that what Infotex presents is often time dated or about new trends, regulations, or guidance, and therefore we cannot provide this material with any warranty whatsoever. Thirdly, material provided with Infotex webinars and movies is copyrighted. You keep the copyright to material customized to your organization, but Infotex reserves the right to use the material in other engagements and boilerplates. See our transfer of copyright agreement at the webpage listed in this slide. Finally, those who view our webinars or movies may be added to an email mailing list. If you do not wish to receive notice of additional educational opportunities, please accept our apologies and please opt out at the web page shown on this slide. Today's webinar is about change management in small banks, how we've been getting a pass on it because nobody wants to define it, and how Dan proposes we get out in front of our auditors and examiners by defining what we mean by change management sooner rather than later. Before we get started, I want to let everyone know that we will be going a bit longer than anticipated today. We always set our goal at an hour, and sometimes it's just not possible to paint a clear and complete picture in that time. So this webinar is closer to two hours. If you or your team can't stay for the whole webinar today, we have already uploaded the full two hours at the link shown here, and you can watch at your leisure. And by the way, yes, if you are a client, you are welcome to the original PowerPoint. It can also be used as an example if you want to present your own version that would make the end result even more powerful. I'm going to quickly go out to our blog site so you can see where our webinar schedule and movies are located to explain the movie within a movie concept in the form of final deliverables. For our webinar schedule, webinars.infotex.com will resolve to this page. It has our upcoming schedule of events and webinars. We will be at the IBA Security Conference October 1st and 2nd and then have our yearly technology planning webinar on the 15th. To watch pre-recorded webinars, simply go to movies.infotex.com. Today's webinar is about change management in small banks, which brings me to the speaker for today's event. The drum roll, please. Thank you. The man with 13 letters after his name, the cyber changeling from Chicago, the bringer of policy and breaker of tech, the poet from We Know It, the awareness guru from Indiana, Dan Hathaway. Dan? Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I am a changeling, or at least I used to be. I have to say that the older I get, the less I feel like change it at least change for the sake of change, let's put it that way. Um, which brings me, once again, to today's shout-out. Um, you know, my shout-out today goes to Joe and Jane. Um, you can see them here. Uh, I guess they found out that we have reserved the venue for 2020 Infotex Jam, and they wanted to camp out for it. So, um 
somebody really needs to let them know that the jam isn't until July of 2020. I, I really don't think they need to be camping out this hey, far Dan? in advance. Dan, you do realize that Joe and Jane are cartoon characters, what? right? What? Are you sure? I mean, just so you know, Mike, uh, these are my guitars. Actually, that's my friend Al's guitar. Uh, but that's my, uh, this right here is my acoustic bass. Uh, you know, this is my 12 string. That's my um, Taylor. I, I'm really proud of that guitar. And I have a couple of, you know, these Damn, are my yes, Those my are guitars. your guitars. I took them and I put them in a cartoon. Oh, oh. It's a cartoon with a picture of your guitar. All right, it. well, okay. Well, good to know. Um, then, uh, well, hey, then my shout out doesn't go to uh, Joe and Jane. It goes to those um, technology people and small community based banks that are, you know, recognizing it's September and pretty soon they need to start thinking about updating their technology plans. So, um, yes, the globe has gone all the way around the sun, folks, and the time is coming near where should be updating our tactical plans. And of course, that assumes you have a cyber cycle that starts in January. I always start the process at least for my clients, at um, the IBA Cybersecurity Conference, which is October 1st and 2nd this year. Um, it's going to be even cooler this year as we are merging uh, the physical and the fraud conferences together. It's going to be kind of like Breakout City, right? Um, but this is the URL here if you want to register. Um, it's a mouthful, but if you're watching the movie version of this webinar, there's a pause button, right? If not, I'll let you kind of grasp that a little bit. But um, today's webinar is where I'm going to be taking some risk, really. Well, I really don't like what the FFIEC has done so far in terms of change management guidance. Um, for one, I mean, this is their definition of change management off of their, you know, IT security handbook. Um and if you look, it's not even, you know, they forgot to put that in actual the footnote. This, you know, the IT environment consists of operating systems, middleware, and then it defines middleware, and then applications, file systems, communication protocol. In other words, they really didn't apply a change management process to their definition of change management, or they would have discovered that they didn't put the footnote in the footnote. They put it right in the text. But... Worse than that is that it really kind of all reduces down to the fact that the FFIC, all they have to say about change management is that we're supposed to create an effective process to introduce change. And, you know, they're really kind of restricting it to the IT environment, of course. But it then establishes, you know, in this third bullet point here, and by the way, I, I kind of fixed this for them and broke it down a little bit. Um, but... The bottom line is, is then they kind of kick out to you need to have a dev environment, a test environment, and a production environment. And and that is true. We're not complaining about that. But the change management, really, the reason why everybody's kind of frightened by change management is because it is a, you know, it's a beast. It's not just about dev test and production. It's about a lot more. And so it kind of leaves us wondering, well, what do you mean by change management? And so that's why I'm putting forth this proposal, because I feel like if we can establish what we mean by change management and get a process in place that's working by the time the FFIEC decides to fix their definition of change management, we will be able to be more in control as to what change management is. And this is the reason why I... I'm really kind of taking some risk here. I'm, you know what I mean? I'm, it, this is really what I, I, you might call our getting out in front of the examiner's risk. Uh, a lot of the legal disclaimers you're probably used to seeing if you've been, you know, following our webinars are kind of centered around what's happening today because we've always felt that small banks are eventually going to have to step up to the plate when it comes to change management. And so this webinar is where I propose let's just call it a poor man's change management methodology. You know, we're not using any fancy applications here. We don't have millions of people, you know, working for us 
what's interesting about the approach I am proposing is that we're going to learn the basics of change management that you need to understand whether we're implementing a spreadsheet-based change management program, which is what I'll be revealing today, or you know whether we do go out and purchase the you know, one of the many applications that are going to start popping up on the marketplace centered on change management. And I believe that in the next four to six years, and gosh, whenever I say that, it ends up being two to three years or you know, six to 12 years, but sometime in the near future, change management applications will probably go from their early adapter status to, you know, will eventually be a late majority phase, which is when most community-based banks pull the trigger on bringing it in. But gosh, if we're talking four to six years, maybe we ought to start getting out in front of our examiners so that when they start saying, hey, how are you handling the issue of change you know I'm and we're not just talking patch management or vulnerability management here which by the way I will use as one of the examples that um, as how is how change management um, addresses patch management and vulnerability management but those two uh, processes are they're not even subsystems of change management they're they're maybe system or sister systems or or you know parallel systems or however you want to say that but um, this webinar, suffice it to say, will be focused more on the basics of change management, and then I'm going to propose the use of a change management spreadsheet that, that's kind of an adaptation of what we use here at Infotex, um, not only to placate the auditors and examiners, but more importantly, to put a true control around the issue of change, and, and really what we're trying to control here is not just availability and security risk it's reputational risk and and the confidence that our management team has in us how about we get started <music> can discuss change management, I think we really need to back away from the trees a bit and check out the whole forest and ask those lifelong philosophical questions like, what is change really, right? I mean, what is change? So back in the day when I was first discovering philosophy and you know how much I enjoyed it and how I could integrate it into my career if I was smart, or at least if I spoke a lot in front of people. Back in those days, one of my favorite sayings was, the only constant is change. I, I, I really liked it. It was very ironic. It was true. Um, it was something that I was embracing. Um, like Michael said, I was a changeling, at least back then. Uh, but for 40 years or so, or you know, you know, here we are like 40 years after I first started learning about that in my career, um, this really is no longer a joke to me. It's it's one of the most true truisms about technology that we know. In fact, you know, we have organized our lives around the principle that the speed of computers will double every two years, or I guess now we've changed that to every 18 months or whatever. Of course, there is a debate as to how long that will go on, but what it's doing is it's driving the constant need for change. Because as our resources improve, we we want to leverage those resources. And so as a, as a user of rural internet technology, by the way, I'm here to tell you that we've been leveraging additional computing speed in ways that create a lot of new buzzwords like big data and artificial intelligence and, you know, ultimately the internet of things. Uh, and let's face it, the reason we're all moving to software as a service models and about everything we do, you know, from Microsoft Office to your backup systems to, you know, like I said, everything. Uh, but the reason why is because our resources are continually making a quantum leap of improvement. And we'd be fools to ignore and not leverage these quantum leaps. And thus, we continue to force change upon ourselves. Our users are being forced to change on a regular basis. And, and even our customers are are continually going through learning curves where they have to learn what 
we want them to use in order to do business with us because we're continually improving upon it and changing it. And of course, this increases security, availability, compliance risk, you know, the whole nine yards, which by extension means that change is a threat that exposes us to reputational risk. Change is the source of most problems. In fact, if you, if you pull up your postmortem reviews that you've documented since, you know, you first started doing them, a case can be made that every availability incident, probably every security incident, and almost every negative incident that we've closed since we started tracking incidents ultimately arose from change of some type. So change causes problems, right? And regardless of what change causes, or really what causes change, we continue to embrace change because we believe it's making our, our life better. And, you know, let's face it, you know, one of the things that we've kind of learned is that one of the best ways to manage technology risk is to not use it. And so people like me are writing articles about how change is causing what I call the American monkey trap. And the fact that Americans are so addicted to technology that we risk our lives sometimes to use technology. And I guess what I'm really saying here is that change can be a threat. And thus, we must manage that threat. And like any other threat, we need to identify it. We, we need to identify the vulnerabilities that are exposed to it. And, and we need to monitor for the threat exploiting those vulnerabilities. But there is a cause to change usually. While change is constant and comes from factors too great in number to track, we can still usually trace most change to a few causes. And, and in my experience, technology change often comes about as a result of our setting, you know, meeting or missing goals. And, and let me rephrase that. To me, technology risk arises from change, a threat that arises from our setting, meeting, or missing goals. And so how can we complain about that? I mean, right? And we were all goals-oriented people. We, we've arrived where we are in our career due to the fact that we've set goals and we've achieved most of those goals. We've missed some of them, but goals have been very, very important to us. And, and, and as technology risk managers, we recognize that there's always a trade-off. In order to pursue goals, we take risk and the risk-reward equation. So if we're going to manage technology risk, we need to wrap our minds around the setting, meeting, or missing of goals. And into, you know, what we've always said, or at least, you know, since the Japanese kind of started saying it in the early 80s, but in order to manage anything, we should measure it. We need to measure goals. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on the reason for setting goals. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page about the notion that it's the existence of goals that causes most change, whether we're setting them, meeting them, or, or failing to meet them. And thus, the management of goals could be how we define change management, which brings me to my first analysis of what we even mean by goals. You, you could say there are are three types of goals that we're always working off of at any point in time if we're productive people and we're staying focused, right? Um, there's there's regular duties, which, you know, are those goals. We never really cross off the list. We just move them back to the next period in the cycle. And and those of us who are information security officers, we, we spend our lives really in, you know, working regular duties, the compliance path is a set of regular duties, right? So, uh, but then there's the objectives and, and these are the new goals or these are the goals we might've been working on for a while, but but they have a clear deadline, all depending on how you name them. You know, they could have sub goals or they could be part of other larger goals. And what they're really, you know, what maybe distinguishes them between regular duties is is regular duties might be assigned to a particular month, you know, so so every January we finish our budgets or, you know, every July we get audited or, you know, if things were that simple, right? But we try to have a target month for regular duties, whereas with objectives, 
you know, not only are we setting deadlines, but we have an intention to close those objectives. In other words, we want to cross them off the list. And, you know, if all goes well, we really no longer need to concern ourselves with them once we have achieved them, once, once we've closed them. Then there are what I have always called arete goals. Um, it's, it's based on a term that I learned from this particular gem of a book, uh, Zen and the Art of Ma Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, in it, Robert Persig discusses a word, arete, and I don't even know if that's the right pronunciation of it, but I've been calling it arete ever since I read this book in the early 80s. And in the ancient Greek language, they used the word arete, and it's a word that we really don't have a translation for in modern English. The way Robert Persig put it is that arete is like a synthesis of excellence with effectiveness, with profitability, with accountability. So it's like a, you know, it's a whopper of a word. You know, not only are we going to be excellent, but we're going to be arete. In regard to goals, I've always considered arete goals to be the types of goals that we probably assign to ourselves during our, our New Year's resolution, right? And so what is it that we want to really focus in on improving this year? It, it, for those of us who take our New Year's resolution serious, maybe I should add to that. But but when we do our annual performance reviews, if, if you're in a bank where you get an evaluation on an annual basis, you probably walk out of that with a set of what I would call arete goals. In other words, you know, maybe we need to improve on our communication skills. Well, it's not like we're going to cross that off the list, but it's also not like it's really a regular duty. It's more of a skill that we want to focus in on because for some reason, our supervisors have said, hey, improve upon your communication skills. Um, another place that arete goals come from is our risk assessments. Uh, we might identify the the top seven risks is something that you know you'll you'll see us do every January we we try to identify the top seven risks well you know how we control those risks could be arete goals in other words you know say our, our top risk this year is you know the denial of service that Microsoft is going to implement upon us if we don't upgrade our operating systems well we could say that fixing that is something we definitely have to get done. You know, maybe it's an objective to fix it, but we're going to identify it as an arete goal because we really want to focus in on it. We want to do a good job this time. We want to get out ahead of it. Maybe we can move to a virtual desktop environment or something where we don't have to, you know, put up with this thing happening on a regular basis to us. To drill down further into my analysis, though, you could say that your regular duties should be what you document in your job description. Objectives, on the other hand, are something we do once and then move on, right? With at least one and done is what we're hoping for. Now, you know, some, some regular duties start off as objectives, but eventually, you know, we decide, hey, let's do this every year. And that happens a lot as a result of audits, right? The, the auditor might say, hey, you need to do a credentialed scan. And so we do that. It's an objective at first because we want to learn how to do a credentialed scan. And we're going to end up having to patch a lot of stuff that we didn't patch when we were doing the uncredentialed scans. Uh, but then once we get through the objective, once we close that out, we might decide, hey, Let's do a credentialed scan every year. We'll continue to do our weekly regular scans, but we'll do a credential scan quarterly, we'll say maybe, or annually or semi-annually or whatever. You know, um, that's when the objective really becomes the regular duty. Now, what I'd like to do here is I'd like to just kind of jump out and give you a little bit of a teaser of the uh, change management spreadsheet. And so we call this spreadsheet the change management spreadsheet. And, uh, you know, it's your typical boilerplate. Um, you know, we have the actual, you know, template that's meant for you to adopt. Um, there are some instructions. I'll be going over all these instructions at the end of the webinar. But I just wanted to, for the sake of, you know, what we're talking about now in the PowerPoint, I, I wanted to just uh, bring up one of the objectives that we have here to, to kind of make a point about it. Um, so let me just kind of zoom in here a little bit. Uh, that's, that's pretty good. All right. So, so this objective here was uh, set up a method 
of monitoring critical vendors using Google Alerts. So we had a couple critical vendors that are privately held. They wouldn't give us their financial statements. And so uh, we're wanting to monitor them using Google Alerts. And so uh, you can see that was actually originally an objective. It said objective over here, right? The point I'm trying to make now is that you can, if you read through this, you can see that by uh, by the end of August we are finished, and and then Dan me uh, started reviewing, you know, and, and watching Google alerts, and and it got to a point where we felt like it was very beneficial to us, but it was pretty tedious, and so by October we said, hey, you know, it's going well, but we'll eventually delegate it to Matt. Well, while it started as an objective. What we realized is that now that we have it set up, we should probably check once a month in order to make sure that we're doing it. I just wanted you to see that something might start off as an objective, but then we convert it to being a regular duty because it makes sense to do it on a periodic basis, not just one and done. It really could be the heart of your change management system. Um, but know that while regular duties must be done periodically, objectives are tracked by deadlines. Well, my motto I've always lived by is that any decision without a deadline is not a decision, it's just a wish. In other words, if we have an objective that does not have a deadline, uh, we should be raising this as a problem in the appropriate meeting. Objectives can be very lofty, high-level you know, missions or strategy statements or goals that we want to achieve or or they could be tactical objectives um, right out of our tactical plan. Uh, steps that we take in implementing the strategy statements that we've designed to help achieve our mission. If our mission is to protect information, then one strategy would be to maintain the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of that information. And then a tactic might be to classify that information. And maybe that starts off as an objective in year one, and then starting in year two, we annually just kind of revisit our information classification to make sure we really um, are still good with what we decided the first year. Um, another tactic might be to put access controls around the information of certain classifications, right? Uh, but if a tactic on our list is to sell information on the internet, Maybe that tactic is a little bit off mission, and, and maybe we should be questioning it. Um, it could be part of another mission, but it certainly does not contribute to the protection of information. And really what I should say is that it could be part of another strategy statement. Um, hopefully there's only one mission, but there might be several strategy statements, and we just want to make sure that our tactics, that our objectives, that our regular duties are achieving strategy statements. One lesson I learned, fortunately, while I was still in my 20s, is that time is a limited resource. There, there are many implications of this lesson, but probably the most far-reaching implication was that if we have a limited resource in time, we should be careful about what we plan to do with that time. We should work on the most important things first so that at the end of the day, what we did not get done is the less important stuff. That, that what we did get done is more important than what we didn't get to. So one of the most important processes or results or outcomes of the change management system or what I call the goal tracking process that we use to implement change management, you know, one of the most important outcomes should be that it gives us the ability to prioritize our efforts based on a tactics relationship to the strategy it's attempting to enforce and, and really how you know, likely is it to achieve the strategy statement. Um, we, we could have tactics that, that lead towards a mission, but they're not as powerful as other tactics. So, so let's implement the tactics that give us the, the most bang for the buck. And the change management system should lend itself to the prioritization of goals in relationship to the objectives and strategies and, you know, ultimately our, our mission. Now, if we're to survive, regular duties should always take top priority and then objectives are meant to be implemented in and around the regular duties. It doesn't always work that way, 
A lot of times we postpone a regular duty because the objective is not only important, but it's become urgent. But in theory, regular duties are supposed to be higher priority than objectives. But you want to know what should take the highest priority? You know, it's a lot easier said than done, but, you know, change management itself should be in a rete goal. It, it should be something that we really focus in on, especially if we're going to try to, to install or create a, tra- a change management program. And the reason why is because change management is a habit or a discipline like many of the other processes that we govern in our IT governance program. And so prioritization is indeed the one of the biggest outcomes from a change management program. And, and the whole purpose of ARETE goals is to establish a higher priority for certain activities. So let's kind of drill down a little bit, you know, on what I mean by ARETE goals. So, you know, in my past, I studied, I studied architecture. I studied Greek architecture, the history of you know, the Greeks. And in particular, I actually wrote a semester-long paper on the Parthenon when I was in college. And, and so this is kind of how when, you know, when I read that book by Robert Piercig, um, you know, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, it, it really resonated with me because I had already saw the word arete. But the entire purpose for this amazing building was to guide the Greek goddess Athena to a place where she could be worshipped. So, so the mission was to guide Athena to the place where she should be worshipped. And Athena was the goddess of wisdom. So this was a very important mission to the Greeks because this was when they were inventing philosophy, which is, you know, you could call it a lot of things, but to me it might be the study of wisdom. And so the entire complex that was the Parthenon it, it was really dedicated to showing Athena how to get to the altar. It's in the back here where the Greeks worshipped wisdom. The design of the building was also where the golden rectangle was born, which is a concept that while the Greeks invented it, mathematicians later diagrammed it as what we call the Fibonacci series. And so, and so the Greeks invented this system of proportions as part of building this building whose mission was to guide Athena to a place where she could be worshipped. And the Parthenon was meant to execute what the Greeks meant by arete. I mean, consider the reason why back when it was an active temple, you placed a marble on the floor of the temple, and when you did that, it would roll. In fact, there are virtually no straight lines or right angles in the Parthenon at all. The the columns themselves are not straight along their vertical axis, axes. And so this was done with the horizontal lines, it was done with the vertical lines, and the reason it was done is because the Greeks wanted Athena to see straight lines. And you see, it would be excellent to have straight lines, but it would be arete if Athena could see them as straight lines. To the Greeks, arete is not perfection. They acknowledged that perfection was impossible to achieve. Instead, Arete was why the designers of the Parthenon made its lines curved so that they would look straight. They designed the columns and frieze of the building with curves so that, in perspective, it would be arete, not just excellent. And it's not done just because the Greeks were optical tricksters, right? Their arete goal served a higher purpose. It was to please the goddess of wisdom. In other words... While most of us thought it would be excellent if the lines in the building were straight, the Greeks thought it would be arete if those lines looked straight to Athena as she came down from the heavens to provide at the altar of the temple. And it wasn't just antasis that the Greeks used to achieve arete with the Parthenon. 
that Fibonacci series I was talking about, or that golden rectangle, you know, everything that you look at, everything in the Parthenon is based on those proportions because the Greeks had decided already that the golden rank rectangle was the most pleasing proportion. They, they had theories as to why it represented wisdom. And so the goddess of wisdom would be more enticed to visit the temple for her to be worshipped in if everything she saw on her way from the heavens into the Parthenon were on the proportion of the Fibonacci series. In other words, it would be excellent to have a pleasing-looking building. It would be a rete to have every single thing you looked at fall in the golden rectangles theory. So I'm sure by now you're wondering why I'm going on and on about this arete stuff, and I'm surprised Michael hasn't interrupted me to ask me that himself. But the reason for this is because one of the things I've learned in my career is that if we can identify out of all the promises we make, the, the millions of promises we make to ourselves each year, you know, what's, what's, what's really kind of funny about the New Year's resolution prom, prom, promise is that it's, it's, it's really reducing everything we could promise down to one thing. We're really implementing an arete goal when we do our New Year's resolution. And what I've learned is that focus gives birth to achievement. And given the purpose that, that well, given the purpose of this webinar is to present a simplified change management system, simplification being one of the primary goals, we should seize the value of using our system to identify the most important goals to us. So arete goals are those regular duties and, and sometimes objectives that we want to address more now than we would normally. I mean, we always want to be able to provide a certain level of service for any of our arete goals or any of our regular duties. But when we assign an arete goal, we're saying, hey, let's focus in on this goal and make it very important to us during this next goals tracking period. In other words, it would be excellent if we got our time entry done here at Infotex before payroll every Monday morning. Um, it's it's really, you know, a, a, a goal that everybody struggles to achieve here at Infotex. So it would be excellent if everybody was done Monday morning, right? But it would be a rete if we used our time entry system to help us achieve more with less. Make sense? It, it would be excellent if we could have a security culture in our banks, but it would be a rete if our customers thanked us for that culture, which, just so you know, has been achieved in some banks that we have helped respond to what started off as very scary incidents. And speaking of incidents, it would be excellent if we could properly respond to disclosure incidents according to the law, is what some bank presidents say. You know, we just want to be according to the law. Well, okay, that would be excellent. But it would be a rete if our customers gave us kudos for the way we responded. If, if we did turn that lemon called a security incident, into lemonade called, hey, you guys really did a good job. I can tell you value my information. That would be a rete. And I've been saying it for years now that incident response is what allows us to turn lemons into lemonade. And what I would say is those that are shooting for excellence or for compliance are not going to achieve that. In order to turn lemons to lemonade, we need to make our incident response program an arete goal until we've felt confident that we can do that. So one question that arises out of this, can we ever say we achieve arete goals? I mean, do we ever cross customer service off a list of goals? Well, no, never. I agree. 
You know, arete goals are never achieved. Uh, when when finished serving a customer, we try to learn from the, you know, experience. And then we try to serve the next customer even better. So, no, we're never going to cross customer service off a list. But we can fulfill our arete goals. We can say to ourselves, customer service has improved substantially since last year. We can even quantify that fulfillment and, and, and say things like, customer complaints have decreased 20% in the last quarter. And what I'm here to tell you is that the bank's already doing this in some way. And so a change management system would allow us, if, if we were using it to, to manage the whole bank and not just the technology, I mean, really the IT governance process is what I'm going to be proposing. But if we were using change management or the system I'm proposing to manage the whole bank, we could make customer complaints, you know, an arete goal instead of just a normal process that we're working so that we focus in on it for the first quarter. And we achieve customer complaints have decreased 20% in the last quarter. So no, arete goals can't be achieved, but they can be fulfilled. And it might be temporary that we fulfill them because you want to know what? Change is constant, right? The only constant is change. One great arete goal is the bank's mission. Thus, you know, if your mission is to provide the best banking services in your area, that's an arete goal. It's, it's not like you're going to cross it off the list, right? And we may develop several strategy statements that help us fulfill our current vision of what that mission looks like. And, and those strategy statements are also arete goals, usually. I mean, it's not like we're going to stop responding to customer complaints if that was a, a strategy, right? But the tactical plan, now we're starting to get out of the high-level fluffy definitions and into the actual to-dos that help us achieve our strategy. And, and, and just so you know, the, the webinar that's coming up next month in October is going to be teaching technology planning. And, and this really is what we're talking about. For, for technology, we're going to say, what's the mission of technology at our bank? And, and how do we envision that mission? What's that look like? Um, and then, you know, what are the top seven strategy statements? Because we want every one of our tactics to be aligned with the strategy that helps us achieve our mission. This is, this is how we achieve strategy alignment, right? But these tactics, the tactical plan down here, they're calls for change. And it is this change that we must manage. So what we are also proposing in our change management program is that we, re we regularly, regularly identify those regular duties and or objectives that we want to turn into arete goals rather than just mere goals. And, and we do that in our prioritization of goals. At Infotex, we do it annually, and we do it as part of our performance evaluation program. So each of us here at Infotex have three arete goals that become a part of our monthly goals review. And just so you know, this process has helped us at Infotex continue to achieve not only what our clients are, are calling excellence, but what we call a rete. causing change, which can cause problems. And thus, we want to manage this change. And the best way to manage anything is by measuring it, or, or so I've learned in my career. And just so you know, that, that truism works. I, I help manage a lot of different processes. And, and, and when we start by measuring it, we end up being much more successful. And so what this means is that the best way to manage change is 
to measure change. So how do we measure something? Well, first we inventory it, right? We make a list of everything that we can notice about that thing that we're measuring. And, and then we classify that inventory so that we can sort it by whatever the like items end up being. So for an example, you know, we could say this task is a regular duty and that task is an objective and these tasks will help us fulfill our arete goals. Um, our, if our classification process lends itself readily to prioritization, when it comes to change, we should try to sort out between wanted and unwanted change, right? And to me, the change that we do not want is the change that leads away from our mission. The change we do want is the change that leads towards our mission. So we must empower our people to say no, to propose tasks that lead away from our mission. And let me repeat that. Change management is about saying no to those tasks that lead away from our mission or our strategy or, you know, our tactic or, or our arete goal. And by the way, these last three steps here where we analyze our goals, let's name this the goals review. And when we see the actual policy, you're going to see that we're changing say no to it to a rather funky word, crystallization. And so let me propose that the goals review is a process that will be the cusp of your change management program. In other words, on a regular basis, you will be analyzing goals by classifying, prioritizing, and saying no to tasks. And so the goals review is accomplished during our team meetings. And that's kind of one of the really important points of the change management program I'm going to be proposing is that we're going to do it in the meetings we already are conducting anyway. And don't get me wrong, there might be a weekly meeting that we conduct that we call our change management meeting. I'm not sure. All depends on how you assemble your change management program. But we want to be sure we have collected all the new goals that may have arisen since the last team meeting where we did the goals review. And then for each of these goals, we want to ensure appropriate prioritization, coordination, and then crystallization. And, and we're going to discuss what I mean by each of these processes in a minute. Uh, but, but what I'd like to do now is just walk through regular duties associated with the goals review. All right. And so the goals review is going to become an annual regular duty. When the bank releases its new business plan, well, we might want to update our strategy and our tactical plan. Um, we definitely update our IT governance program once a year, right? That's, that's something that we might you know, do during our goals review, or at least prioritize and strategize, you know, which policies do we review? You know, which procedures are we going to focus on? Maybe we make those arete procedures. Um, then, of course, we have our evaluation goals that we could roll into our change management program. Um, quarterly, then, uh, at Infotex, at least, we do, or we take a look at what we call the yearly preview, and it's it's really done at a high level, and, and what we're doing there is, you know, at the beginning of the year, we're saying, hey, in order to achieve our arete goals, we need to do this in quarter one, that in quarter two, that in quarter three, blah, blah, blah. And so, once a quarter, we update that, keep moving it, because life doesn't stop at the end of the year, right? And so, we keep moving. So, so, so in second quarter, we're looking at first quarter of the next year. Then monthly, we're taking a look at this month and next month. Um, and we'll show you how this actually gets queued up in the change management spreadsheet that I kind of tease you with earlier. And then, of course, weekly, we're looking at what goes on this week, right? And so once a month, we might update our, our, our monthly goals. But then once a week, we might look at those monthly goals and say, hey, what do we need to achieve this week in order to achieve these monthly goals? Because we need to achieve the monthly goals in order to achieve the quarterly goals, which are necessary in order to achieve our annual goals. And then, of course, daily, we should be taking a look at what's going on, not only today, but also tomorrow. So we're going to start with the most difficult and yet the most important parts of the processes that I, I you know, talked about when we talked about the goals review. So just by way of review, 
you know, there's collection of our goals, then we're going to, you know, coordinate those goals, then we're going to prioritize those goals, and then we're going to crystallize those goals. So the collection process, I feel, is the most important one because we're making promises. So in order for the change management process to work, we need to keep track of when we make promises to our team. Remember when I define goals as promises? Well, we make these promises all week long. At Infotex, we have a, a secure chat room that we call Slack. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of documentation of promises made in Slack. And so if we're doing a good job of goal tracking, it's like we're putting all of our promises into one place, the change management spreadsheet, and then we watch that one place. So we're putting all of our goals in one basket, and then we watch the basket. And this is a habit. It's a discipline. It, it's, it's not easy to get. It's a lot easier for me to say we're going to collect our goals. Um, it's going to take time for a man, management team members just to, to get in the habit of whenever I make a promise, what I'm doing is I'm setting a goal. That creates change. That could cause problems. We better track it. And doing so allows us to meet those promises or, more importantly, give a heads up when we cannot meet our promises. Coordination is an awareness exercise. Um, if we decide in January that we're going to look into a virtual desktop environment and by July this promise turns into a new promise that we're going to be implementing a virtual desktop environment, then we need to make sure the appropriate people are aware of these decisions. But what will be one of the most important pieces of information that the team needs to know about the decision to implement? Exactly. We, we want to know by when. If someone says, hey, we're going to be implementing something, the first question that we usually ask is when, right? And this kind of relates back to my mantra, which is a decision without a deadline is simply a wish. It's not a decision. It's just, it's just something we're thinking about. Once we assign a deadline to it, well, you know, I mean, that's going to be based on how important the goal is to us. And just so you know, prioritization is how we establish what I'm going to re reveal as crystallization. And prioritization is how we make sure that the goals we commit to, the goals that we crystallize, the goals that we tell our team members we're going to achieve, which by the way is a promise, right? Prioritization is how we make sure that they relate to the mission by assigning them to tactics meant to enforce strategy statements that will lead to the fulfillment of an arete goal called the bank's mission. And prioritization should be done with each task. And unless there are blanket guidelines about prioritization, the employee really should have their supervisor be in charge of assigning the priority. And, and so blanket guidelines I want to come back to. But before I, I, I come back to it, I just, I just want to point out that, you know, we already alluded to earlier how sometimes regular duties get postponed or, or you know, like if it's a weekly regular duty, sometimes they just simply get skipped because we've allowed high priority goals to become urgent high priority goals. And usually what causes that is new promises. And so one of the most important parts of change management is the least lengthy word that needs to be a part of our vocabulary. And that word is no. We have to learn how to say no. And prioritization is our justification for no, because we can say, hey, that doesn't contribute to the mission, or hey, that wasn't part of our plan. What's going to be lowered in priority if we give this new objective the high priority? Now, back to what I mean by blanket guidelines. These are, these are guidelines that your, your team will start developing and evolving as you start meeting weekly or monthly or whatever you decide bi-weekly maybe um, around your change management spreadsheet. And again, when we get to the spreadsheet, you'll see how I'm proposing that you have several meetings centered around that spreadsheet, some of which might be weekly, some of which might be monthly. But what I mean by bank at guidelines can be illustrated by a few guidelines that we've established here at Infotex. And, and really, Customer work always takes top priority at Infotex. It's even higher priority than evaluation goals or arete goals or whatever you want to call it. And, and in fact, if you came to your annual performance review at Infotex and you could demonstrate that you achieved none of your evaluation goals, but the main reason why 
is because you were what we call fully billable, meaning that 40 hours a week were spent working for customers, that would yield a very good evaluation, just so you know. Yes, maybe we didn't get any of our objectives met. Maybe we didn't get any of our arete goals met or fulfilled. But the regular duties that relate to our customer service were all met. How can you complain about that? And at Infotex, we say that regular duties always come higher priority than objectives. But like I said earlier, they don't. You know, And, and another great example is that Sophia has as a high priority objective due today to deliver some graphics for this webinar. And, and, and that objective might have to take precedence over a couple of her weekly regular duties. But as her supervisor, I'm on to that. I, I've approved that because we manage change using a change management spreadsheet and thus our change is managed well. The implications of Sophia not getting those regular duties done represents low risk. The implications of me having bad graphics for this webinar represent higher risk. Makes sense? But during the goals review, we have to find how ever-changing priorities can be. So in other words, if you implement this change management system and you start reviewing your goals on a regular basis, you're going to start realizing that goals don't keep the same priority that the priorities themselves are changing constantly you know the only constant is change and priorities too are part of the constant that changes but if you buy into my notion that awareness is 9-11 set of battle what a good change management program will do is make us aware of those changing priorities and just so you know at infotex at least we see this with almost every new idea that I come up with, right? So Dan has a great idea, and when we first review it, we assign maybe an A priority to, to it because, you know, a customer was telling us about it or a, a client wanted it or whatever. But after time goes by, maybe we dig into the idea a bit further and find that it requires more resources than, than we have to dedicate, or, or maybe it's just not that great of an idea, or more importantly, maybe we have realized that it takes us away from our strategy statements rather than leading us to them. And then over time, we lower that priority because of that concept. It happens a lot with me. I'll be talking to a client. I just, it just happened recently. I was, I was talking to a client about how one of their exam findings was they needed a project management um, program. And I was like, really? A, a little bank like yours? Well, we immediately had an A priority. We're going to develop a royal plate for project management, et cetera, et cetera. But then we started realizing, well, this is only one bank. We haven't been hearing other examiners say anything about this. And so we kind of put it on hold. And the way we did that was we lowered the priority to a C from its initial A priority. Now, I've referred to crystallization a few times already in this webinar. And it's really where the rubber meets the road if we're going to have a change management program that works. And in fact, I just said that prioritization is what sets up crystallization, right? And it does. But first, let me define what I mean by crystallization, okay? And so if you think about water, all right, in its liquid form, it's very undefined. It'll, it'll take any shape. You know, we need a container to keep it in. You know, we don't really have a good definition of it as water. But when it's frozen, when it's turned into its crystalline state, not only is it better defined, but it can be broken into smaller, more manageable parts. We can see it. We can manage it. We can move it around easier. We can say this is a bigger piece of ice than that. You know, we, you know there's a lot of things we can do with water when it's frozen. So in our goals review... When we analyze a new task, assign a priority to it, establish a deadline for it, determine who will be responsible for it, and as importantly, who needs to know about it, who needs to be aware of it, what we're doing there is we're taking water and we're freezing it. We're crystallizing. And in goal tracking, without crystallization, we achieve nothing. Now, <clears throat> after this webinar, you know, has talked about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, I feel that, you know, if I bring up the thoughts of a yogi, I might lose my audience, right? But this is a different kind of yogi, a guy named Yogi Berra, that I think we'll all agree achieved many great things. 
And to me, this yogiism, if we don't know where we're going, we might end up somewhere else. That shows me that Yogi Berra understood crystallization. He understood what we mean by crystallization. But for the purposes of change management, crystallization can be simplified by just focusing in on identifying what we cannot get done and then communicate that as status. And by the way, that's a two-way communication because what ends up happening is that the technology recovery team might say, we can't get this done. And they communicate it to the IT steering committee, which then communicates back saying, well, you have to get that done. And then the discussion starts. Well, what do you want us to sacrifice in order for us to get that done? Most importantly, and really especially when technical people are involved, at least I've found, is that crystallization helps us identify when we are procrastinating. And if we can see procrastination as not a, a bad thing, as a natural thing, as something that naturally occurs, especially with people that are managing huge numbers of multiple priorities, does that remind you of anybody like technical people? Procrastination is just a natural phenomenon that we want to break through. And the way we break through procrastination is first we identify it that, hey, you know, we're procrastinating on this. But then we try to identify the false evidence appearing real that causes that procrastination, which very often is what I call the salami effect. So let's kind of unpack what I just said there, right? So if we can bring awareness to the process, which is what crystallization is to help us to do, because we have that scary deadline approaching and we've done nothing about it yet, right? It will help us break through procrastination by helping us identify what we're afraid of. Because almost every time I found myself procrastinating in my life, it was always the result of some false evidence appearing real. We, you know, I thought that I wasn't going to be able to learn how to, uh, uh, to do a movie out of a webinar. You don't know how long I procrastinated on that. But our CMS, our change management spreadsheet, tells us how long we've been procrastinating or we had been procrastinating on what started off as a scary task. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the things I was scared of is that, you know, what if I start you know, coughing in the middle of the webinar, which I apologize for doing right now. But one of the elements of fear that usually arises, especially in technology planning and change management, is what I call the salami effect. And, and what I mean by that is when we see a task or a project or a strategy as a monolithic, huge, you know, intimidating thing, all right? And so... It's just not appealing, is it? This salami, for example, does not look that appealing to me at all. But if we were to cut it up to smaller, more manageable pieces, and what I've called crystallization, by the way, in this webinar, it's much more appetizing. Mmm. I think I'll take a break and get me some of that criminelli my friend brought over. I'm talking about great salami. goals and goal tracking at a high level, I am ready to present my proposed simplified change management approach for small banks. And you might think here that CMS stands for change management system. And uh, if that's what you've been thinking, I say, let's leave it that way because we are proposing a system here, which is, you know, what I mean by that is a system is comprised of many subsystems and uh, is part of a larger system. But in actuality, CMS stands for a spreadsheet that I'm going to introduce here in a few minutes, a, a, a Dan spreadsheet. I mean, I'm known for my spreadsheets, right? And it's a spreadsheet that the entire change management process can be centered around. 
So CMS stands for Change Management Spreadsheet. But first, let me reiterate a few important principles that we've established so far. Starting with the notion that we will always deal with change. But no worries, we can reduce risk exposure and increase our effectiveness by managing change. Now, it won't be easy because it's going to require us to get into certain habits surrounding the collection, coordination, prioritization, and crystallization of goals, which is a set of processes that require us to work with deadlines. But we can do it in a simple manner. And what I'm showing you today is a simplified change management process intended for smaller businesses and banks, really, who are not yet ready to spring for expensive, cumbersome change management applications that require you to have millions of people in order for them to work. And like everything else in a bank, the simplified process starts with the policy. So let's take a look at that policy. Hey Dan, I just wanted to remind you and everybody else that the movie and Buller Plates will be available at the link shown. We are changing the way we do webinars. I'm not exactly sure how this these files are getting to you, but if you don't have these files, know that you can email info at infotext.com and we'll send you these files. Now, I also want you to know there's a more complex method that we already have you know, in our boilerplate set, and we're not talking about this. These are different um, uh, documents. It, it still does leverage a, a change management spreadsheet, uh, but this is a more simplified method that we're showing you here today, which starts with the change management policy. And so let's just kind of walk into that. Um, change management is part of what we call the security standards or the technical security standards program. It's, you know, if we, if you think about InfoTexas, eight different programs, and you're familiar with that, uh, change management is something that is really meant mainly for the technical staff. And so all of our boilerplates, you know, have, you know, this, this language at the beginning. Um, it's very important that you, you know, sh focus in on the instructions here where it talks about the color coding, but I guess I also need to point out to you that there's a transfer of copyright agreement um, on our website, um, and, and that's listed in here as well. Uh, but what I want you to know is that this particular template here is just meant to be language that you insert into um, some other you know, some high level, you know, board level policy, or maybe even uh, a management level procedure. Um, it's not meant to be its own standalone document. Now, we always have a cover page in case for some reason you want it to be standalone, but know that, you know, I mean, this is, is meant to be um, language that you just copy and paste into an existing procedure. Um, the other thing I want to point out is this is the first iteration of this. I'm I'm proposing this change management program as a simplified program for smaller community-based banks, but this is not a, an evolved set of boilerplates, you know, where, you know, it's been tried and true and, you know, been tested, been audited, that sort of thing. But, you know, get to where you can, you know, can see the gist of this. I wanted to, you know, point out, by the way, is that there's also a bunch of policy language in here. I, I doubt you'll use any of this unless it's a standalone policy, right? And that's not our intention. Our intention is you just copy and paste this into an existing document. But suffice it to say, uh, we are setting up what I believe would probably be a weekly meeting. Um, now, we're, you might say, well, we're a little bank. Well, our, our whole company is pretty small, Right. And so, you know, our management team only has three people in it and, and we meet weekly. So, you know, we've got a busy you know schedule. But what we've learned is that this change management spreadsheet helps save so much time because once again, we're telling people what we're not going to get done. And usually that's stuff that leads us away from our mission. So we're working on the most important stuff first. That makes us more productive. But more importantly, it also makes us safer because we're dotting all our I's and crossing all our T's on the compliance work that we need to do. We have a lot of compliance work. We get audited, 
you know, more than once a year. And we got, you know, we're in the FFIC examination program, blah, blah, blah. As bankers, you probably don't want me complaining about how much I get, or, you know, our company gets audited. But the point being is that this is really making us look great in our audits because we're, we're getting everything done with just limited number of resources. And what we don't get done has a paper trail to it where we've actually approved that it's not going to get done. And so this, you know, sets up that the chain, you know, establishes the change management spreadsheet or the CMS. Um, and, and it establishes that it's going to be used to track deadlines, completion dates, accountability, priorities, neck review dates, you know, the, the approval of change, the crystallization of change. It's also going to be synced with other task processing like your audit tracking spreadsheet. There's a new finding in the audit tracking spreadsheet and it's related to technology. As an auditor, if I looked at your change management program set up using this methodology, I'd want to make sure that those audit findings are also in the CMS. Um, likewise, with risk assessment action items, you know, postmortem review action items. You know, a lot of times people say, well, now where are we supposed, what are we supposed to do with these? You should plug them into your change management program should be our answer. But we say is, well, be sure they get into your risk assessment or whatever document that gives birth to new priorities for your bank. Well, now we have a methodology. We make sure that, that postmortem review action items get put into the CMS, um, audit findings, exam findings. Uh, you know, you, you saw the slide, all the different sources of goals, you know, and so the collection process is really what we're talking about here. Um, and then, you know, the tactical plan, if you're, you know, this would come out, of course, if you aren't doing this yet, but um, if you come to our October workshop, we'll be talking about the annual process of updating your technology strategy and your and your technology plan. And we've divided that into, you know, the the strategy and the tactical plan. And so the tactics should be entered into the CMS as well. Um, your evaluation goals can go into the CMS, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by the way, our evaluation goals are public. We might have some private evaluation goals, but those are goals number four and five. But the three evaluation goals that we identify at the beginning of the year for everybody, they go into the CMS. We track those on a monthly basis. Um, and then the policy establishes that, you know, we're going to be, and really to me the most important part of this is that we're going to be communicating the tasks that will not be achieved by the assigned deadline. Remember, that's the most important part of crystallization are those tasks that will not be achieved by the assigned deadline. Um, and then again, you know, there's these concluding sections. But let's go ahead and return now. As you can imagine, if we're doing a good job of maintaining job description on everybody, part of the collection process would include making sure that all of the duties expressed in our job description makes it into our CMS. And, and, and actually, maybe one of our annual regular duties is to go through the CMS and use it to update our job descriptions. Because what happens is we start adding stuff into the CMS um, during our goals review meetings. And so at least regular duties more than a month should be put into the job description, right? Or, or the CMS um, from your job description. So let's just take a look at uh, our, our boilerplate for our information security officer job description here. So believe it or not, uh, this is a um, boilerplate that has been evolving over many years. Um, let's just kind of take a look at the, uh, the revision history for this because we kind of proudly, yeah, it was May 2004 that we first realized maybe we ought to do a job description for the information security officer. We, we, uh, we keep this in the um, uh, management awareness training program. We, we actually encourage our clients to provide their information security officer's job description to every management team member. I hate it when I notice stuff in the boilerplates. Of course, this isn't going to get changed in the actual boilerplate. Probably if I did that, I wouldn't notice that stuff anymore, right? But but makes sense. So this is pretty well evolved. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's just your typical, you know, boilerplate for a job description. And, and uh, all of our job descriptions, though, have one little component of it, which is the reason why I'm kind of going out here. And so I wanted to show this to you because... 
this is really important. I mean, you know, it has the uh, assigned security responsibility. Um, if your auditors are saying, hey, where is the board assigning you to be the information security officer? Well, if you adopt this job description as your official job description, you could say it's in our job description to get reviewed annually or whatever, right? But anyway, what I wanted to get to and really kind of point out is that it also establishes regular duties on, you know, um, believe it or not, an information security officer might have an every 18 month uh, regular duty um, if we're doing a good job on our exam posture and our cycle is 18 months or maybe every two years or whatever. And then, of course, I'm going to zoom back out a little bit here because I don't want you to have to actually, you know, digest. But you can see there's, an, you know, annual, quarterly, bi-monthly, monthly, weekly, daily, and, and as needed. Uh, regular duties in this job description and then you know we're big believers in distribution lists and don't know if you noticed here but once again we feel like the whole management team should get the information security officer's job description um, in all of our boilerplates this revision history is not it's not the history of the boilerplate it would be the history of your document once you adopted it uh, to your bank so um, this is the the job description um, and really what I wanted to show you here, and by the way, green is examples. We're not saying these should be your regular duties. You're going to have to come up with these on your own based on your own information security program calendar, right? Um, but you have that somewhere. Somewhere you've got notes in terms of what you need to do when, you know, maybe it's in your calendar or maybe it's in an Excel spreadsheet. If you're a, a, a client of Dan's, it's probably somewhere in an Excel spreadsheet. If it's not in your change management spreadsheet, which is really where we're suggesting that you track this stuff when you update your job description you again would get new information for it from the change management spreadsheet so let's go ahead and go back to that powerpoint we've discussed the policy we've shown you this the job description and i bet you're just dying to see what we've been calling that cms i mean i know you saw it during our teaser right but before we do that let me use a regular duty that is fast becoming a standard job for Joe and Jane ISO. Um, and really, it might be an arete goal in your bank, even if you don't have a process in place to define or to identify what your arete goals are. And so a typical process for vulnerability management has four steps. Um, you know, of course, it starts with a policy, but then the policy establishes that we need to find and prioritize and, and then test, and, and really prioritization includes the testing. If, if we decide that a particular patch can't be, if you know we find that a particular patch is gonna blow things up, well then we're gonna lower the prioritization of it in our next application. And then finally, we're going to scan to make sure that what we thought we applied actually did get applied. And then that, of course, will find the vulnerabilities that we still haven't patched. And then we're going to, you know, continue to process. And it goes on and on and on and on and on forever, doesn't it? Well, really, we could say that each of these steps are a regular duty, right? I mean... Well, maybe three regular duties, all depending on the typical patch cycles of the vendors that we're working with. But since about 2003, Patch Tuesday has driven a monthly cycle that most ISOs are now a part of for the Microsoft mess that is continually needing to be fixed, right? Um, but then we have to either test that the patch, you know, will work. Or, you know, with Microsoft, I know a lot of smaller banks are waiting a few days to see if there's any bad press about them. But, you know, note that, you know, the, the period for third party applications is monthly as needed. In other words, we, we may not do it every month for every publisher, but we're going to at least schedule a time to check, prioritize, test, and scan monthly. And if the patch is a critical patch, we might end up applying it immediately. Otherwise, we want to have a scheduled basis for this, and thus we're putting it into our change management spreadsheet as a monthly regular duty. Now, this is probably assigned to the network guys, by the way, and, and not the ISO, right? But it's still a process that would be maintained in a change management system, or spreadsheet, if you ask me. It's what we want to check up on. Did you, did you test the, the patch, right? Um, and do we have documentation of that? 
Well, the change management spreadsheet can be that. And then we either have to test the patches or wait a few days to, you know, apply them. Um, and of course, applying the patch is usually a lot easier said than done. And I, you know, don't want to make that out to be a, a, a really, you know, uh, an easy thing to do. I, I realize it's, you know, all depends on the patch, the, the, the month, the, the application, and, you know, the availability to people that are applying the patches. And we rarely get it right the first time, which results nowadays in the ISO running a scan on the network to ensure that we have properly patched endpoints. And, you know, let's go see where these are in the job description. What I really want to do here is I just kind of wanted to zoom in a little bit on the uh, job description because I wanted to, you know, use this as maybe an opportunity to show you here how um, these regular duties can be derived from that salami that we've been calling vulnerability management, right? And so, so here we've taken the salami, at least for the information security officer, and we've diced and sliced it into some pretty much more easily manageable pieces, right? And so, you know, one, we want to, you know, on a monthly basis, we want to report on our weekly NESA scan. So, so what are we saying there? Well, the, in this case, the incident, I mean, the, the information steering, the IT steering committee is who the ISO would report to on vulnerability management, at least if our entire IT governance program is adopted, right? And so what we're saying is that, you know, the, the, the vulnerability management program would would report into the IT steering committee. And so even though we're doing those NESA scans weekly and maybe bringing the results into the weekly change management team meeting, right, we're actually reporting to the IS steering committee on a monthly basis. Um, and then also, you know, right, right after Patch Tuesday should be on our calendars to participate in the Microsoft and any other kind of third-party patch testing. Um, and again, that would be we would be reminded of that, by the way, by our change management spreadsheet, which I know you're probably dying to see now. Um, but you know, while I'm here, also, you know, just just you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of as needed regular duties that the information security officer needs to be concerned with, right? Um, and then also, it's important for I'd just like to point out too that you know, committee meetings if if they're if they're done weekly, well, then no big deal. But if they're on a monthly basis. Let's get those meetings into the change management spreadsheet so that we can be ready with an agenda driven from the change management spreadsheet for each of those meetings. In other words, we no longer have to keep an agenda for those meetings if we adopt this change management program. And I'll, I'll help you understand that even more in a few minutes here. But for now, how about we go back to that PowerPoint? And so... You know, let's just kind of run through the auditor questions about patch management to, to see, you know, how this change management system is going to work, right? So the auditor asks, are you touching, uh, are you testing your patches? Hopefully we're saying yes, weekly. Where are you documenting this, the auditor might ask. Our answer can be in the change management spreadsheet. The auditor might ask, are you approving those changes? Are, are you approving the changes to the system? Our answer should be, of course. Well, where's that documented? In the change management spreadsheet. The auditor asks, are you fixing the missing patches? I see you're scanning, you know, looking for patches that didn't get applied. Are, are you fixing that? Well, we're trying to is usually the answer there. Uh, but we've identified what we haven't fixed yet in the change management spreadsheet. Do you see how change management ends up being a great place to document our methodologies, to document change? Now, let's return to the original definition um, that the FFIEC has for change management. And if you remember, I wasn't really happy with it. I mean, they butchered it from a grammatical perspective, but it also was really kind of limited to the old, you know, you need to keep everything in a dev test and production environment and segregate those environments, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
Well, what I didn't show you then is that they do go beyond that a little bit to bullet point out what, to me, looks like items that auditors should be checking against. Um, it still doesn't really define change management the way I'm wanting to. Um, and I mean, it leaves it all up to us. So in other words, we still need a procedure to guide the process of introducing changes into the environment. And that's what I'm proposing today. But related to everything else on this bullet pointed list, the change management spreadsheet should be where the auditors find documentation of answers to the question. And so are we clearly defining requirements for change? Well, yes, we are in the um, notes field in the change management spreadsheet should be our answer. Um, are we validating that new hardware complies with institution policies? Well, we have a, you know, a hardening procedure that we use for that, but we invoke and we refer to that hardening procedure as we document that the hardening has been completed in the change management spreadsheet. So, so you know, this, you know, the process there would be you would see acquire new asset as maybe the 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 project name, and then in the description field you would see that we would harden that asset before we commit it to the production environment. Um, and so we really need a place where we can document change. So now I bet you're just dying for me to show you that change management spreadsheet, right? Aren't you? I mean, and, and why is that? Because you now realize we need a place to collect coordinate, prioritize, and crystallize our goals, don't we? I mean, we need to have a place that we can gather around in order to conduct our weekly goals review. Hey, Dan, I just wanted to remind you and everybody else that the movie and Buller Plates will be available at the link shown. And so you've earned it. We're going to go out to the change management spreadsheet. And, and just so you know, I, I want to review the overall organization, but then I'm going to dive into some examples because I want to show you how this works. And, and really, we're going to touch on, you know, the vulnerability management process as, as a tactic that maybe should be an arete goal for a lot of us bankers these days. So here we are um, at the boilerplate uh, for the change management spreadsheet. This is what uh, you've either downloaded or you can email us at info at infotext.com to, uh, you know, get a copy of this. Um, just so you know, you know, what I mean, it starts off with a blank template. Um, we're going to go through each of these instructions. Uh, but what I really wanted to do is I want to start off by just kind of showing you how this baby's organized. Uh, once again, um, revision history that this is for you, not us. Um, this is actually our initial iteration of this template so um, and actually I'm sorry I take that back this isn't this has been in development for a while um, these examples uh, you know I mean you might say hey you know what some of these we can use in ours but they're meant really more for training purposes um, like you know as you saw earlier you know one of them was an Infotex um, uh, priority the, the Google Alerts thing is something we're doing for our vendor management program um, and so uh, and by the way, I mean, you know, there was a time when a lot of banks might have identified the vendor management program as being a strategy statement that, hey, we're going to, you know, shore up vendor risk management. You know, I mean, that might be, might have been, a, you know, a strategy statement out of your technology plan, or it could have even been something that we elevated to an arete goal uh, because we really wanted to get our arms around vendor management again. So... Hope that makes sense to you. But let's just kind of start at the beginning here um, and uh, and just walk through. So this is the, the project number. Uh, what what we have in our CMS is, is uh, twice a year or semi-annually. We go through and update these uh, because what you'll notice is that, you know, as you add new priorities, and you can tell this has been added since the last uh, number update, um, if we sort by numbers, you'll find at the at the bottom of this list. I'm hoping that end down goes out. Well, all right, we'll go end up from here. But you know, we've got 127 examples in here, right? But also, I think it's probably at the bottom here. Um, the unnumbered priorities here are um, 
you know what I mean, the new objectives. And so we'll go ahead and assign them new numbers, you know, twice a year. And, and But we're working these objectives, whether they have numbers assigned or not. And the order that we're working them in is the next check date. And so what we mean by that, let's go ahead and sort by the next check date, is that um, is that this this particular change management spreadsheet is pretending to be set up to address um, several different meetings, okay? And so there's a weekly change management team meeting that the technology recovery team sits in. Um, and then there's a monthly IT steering committee meeting. And, you know, who knows? We can actually pull down and see what kind of committees we have set up here. But but just so you know, at, at Infotech, well, there must be a facilities meeting as well. Um, but at Infotex, uh, we actually have a, a management team meeting, um, a tech team meeting, a NAC meeting, and a and and a, kind of like a shareholder meeting. It's like a board meeting, but we don't have a board. Uh, but it's 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 Sean and the two owners. And so the point being is that we control all of the change uh, related to these meetings from this change management spreadsheet. But the next checkpoint then is really the next time whatever ha you know meeting happens to be, you know, and, and when we set this up, we probably didn't realize you don't want to have an IT steering committee meeting the same day you have a technology recovery team meeting, right? But and, and just so you know, if the IT steering committee meets monthly, we really wouldn't see anything lower than uh, monthly on the cycle because why would you be checking something weekly if you're only meeting monthly so hope that makes sense but but anyway so the next check date is the next time we're going to talk about this particular issue and and it doesn't always work that way sometimes something will come up and we'll be like well you know we're not supposed to talk about that again until sometime in the future i don't know exactly when but we'll we'll use the search features of of you know uh, uh excel so that you know it's easier to find that um uh, but and then the system you know, with us, we actually, for system, we would include client names here too as well. Um, but anything compliance related, you know, we, we, we put that under information security program calendar because that's just a list. You can get a list of everything that needs to be happen compliance-wise by filtering down to that. But then we also have infrastructure as a system. Um, we have, you know, client names. We have marketing uh, we have conferences, you know, I mean, that sort of thing. And so, you know, this is really going to be up to you. How do you want to slice and dice these goals based on the systems that they relate to? Um, I, I have run across a bank that, that, you know, used access management, risk management, vendor management, incident response, business continuity, you know, the, the various programs in their IT governance program as their system. And it seemed to be working well for them, um, but I haven't. We haven't audited them. They rotated to a different bank for three years, and so I'm really looking forward to see how they how they've evolved that. They were definitely an early adopter of this change management uh, program. Um, this is where we establish accountability. This is where we establish coordination. And so this right here, if you look at our examples, they're just kind of boilerplate examples. But but what you will very often do is list people in here. In other words, it might not necessarily be the CERD. It might be John, Joe, and Susie, or it just might be Joe, or it might be John, or whatever. Um, a lot of times, this is the person that, you know, we want to communicate, hey, we're not getting it done when we told you we were going to. Or a lot of times, this might be the team that we report up to, especially in the case of regular duties. Um, the cycle, if it's not a regular duty, it'd be an objective, right? And so this is either objective or regular duties and we include as needed by the way as a cycle um now the as needed stuff would still need some kind of a next check date um just because we want to bring it up and say hey nothing's happened th since the last time we checked on this blah 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 um last completion date uh would be a date for objectives you know it would usually you know we don't it, i mean if we don't want to you know these really aren't set up right because if you ask me if it's a weekly regular duty we're not going to put in every darn week of the year you know i mean that would really kind of throw this off so we're just going to put weekly it we, we complete it weekly um the due date likewise for for weekly regular duties we'd you know we'd use weekly here as well um, for the due date. And, and by the way, the instructions here kind of spell out a lot of this stuff that we're talking about here. Um, but anyway, the point being is that, you know, 
the objectives should have dates assigned to them. If they don't have dates assigned to them, then we'd want to use pending, right? Now, this right here is would probably be the only place in the spreadsheet that you could say is left unpopulated, but we actually have a policy that says all fields meet, must be populated. And so in this particular case, since it hasn't been achieved yet, we'd use work in process to, you know, identify that, hey, you know, this is a goal, it's an objective, we haven't achieved it yet. All right, and by the way, green is examples, but all these are, are examples. I wanna, I wanna stress to you that every single one of these columns here is simply an example task. Uh, we're not saying this would be a task in a bank. Um, so due dates, you know, we wanna have them all populated. If it's a regular duty, we might use the month that it's due, if it's like work quarterly or, or biannually or whatever. Um, but if it's like a monthly regular duty and we don't want to track a due date for every single one, we just use monthly in there. Now, some monthly due dates, we do want to check when it's done. Some we don't. That would be up to the discretion of the person who's running the meeting, the, the chair of the meeting, as to whether we use you know, monthly for monthly regular duties here or whether we give an actual date. It could say here the 15th of the month. Um, and just so you know, we have a lot of compliance stuff that are due for during the compliance meeting. So we would actually put compliance face to face here. Um, it's a it's a meeting we hold to go over all of the compliance stuff. It's like a user awareness training meeting, right? Um, but definitely face to face, you know, the compliance face to face would be when a lot of this stuff is due. Um, by the way, what I'm putting in here might not apply to the actual goal. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, point being is that, um, you know, the due date doesn't necessarily have to be a date unless it's an objective. If it's an objective, then we're definitely going to want to use a, a, these aren't objectives. But you get my point. And, and hopefully we pre-populated this to, to kind of reflect that, that, that objectives would all have due dates associated with them or else we've got a problem right and and so if we don't know the due date because a lot of times our new objectives we're not exactly sure when we're going to assign a due date to them we'd want to use the word pending here and what we're learning is that at the end of the meeting if the last thing we can do it we do is filter down to pending for all the teams wow talking about a good awareness and it's very simple it's very easy it's very quick and it makes us aware of potential curveballs that we might have to be addressing because there's new stuff coming into the plan that wasn't in the plan when we decided what we could do when we did our tactical plan at the end of the previous year, you know, et cetera. So um, the filtering, <clears throat> you're probably already starting to see how filtering really can kind of help make the goals review um, powerful. Um, now the strategy statement, <clears throat> this is meant for alignment, right? Um, this is meant to help us with our prioritization. If we can't decide how a new objective aligns to a strategy, then we should be questioning whether the new objective should receive a priority, right? And so what we're basically, now safety, you know, if you're an information security officer, almost everything you do probably relates to safety. It's, it's probably a, a, a cheating strategy statement. But what we see in a lot of banks are strategy statements like competitiveness, resilience, safety, um, the new objectives. Maybe we want to be a late majority adapter, um, and we are seeing some banks that basically would, well, actually, I just kind of set that up, but, but I do see some banks that, that will have strategy statements that are almost like tactical plans, but they were so important to the bank that they, they elevated them uh, to strategy statements. And a good example of that would be, you know, back when everybody was getting hammered because they didn't have data flow diagrams. You know, data flow diagrams are a tactic, in my opinion, but, but people might have of elevated them to be a strategy statement because they wanted to make sure they got it done before the next audit. And then here's probably one of the most important columns in the whole thing. Uh, you'll notice we did a bad job of populating our examples. I think we got almost everything, you know, well, I guess we do have some B's and C's, but, but I'll be honest with you. I told a guy who was setting this up to just get everything in A and I'll go through and change it as, as necessary. Um, uh, tactics and arete goals. We'll, we'll kind of break that out. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The meeting, that's really the team that's going to be reviewing the um, particular task. And so usually the next check date's assigned to when the, the team's meeting, right? Um, and, and we'll learn that, you know, when we're going through the meeting, what happens is after we get done dressing each task, if we can close it, we're going to put Z closed here, right? And we'll talk about some of this other stuff later. 
Um, but if we're not going to close it, then we'll move it back to a, a new checkpoint, you know, and that could be the next time the team meets. It could be, hey, let's move it back a couple of months, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at this, you'll see that we kept moving things back two months until we finally said, hey, it's a it's a regular duty that's working now. So we're just going to put monthly in the, you know, the due date and the cycle and everything. And, and, and now it's a monthly duty to check to make sure that Matt. Uh, we we kind of at this originally started off Dan Hadaway and informed the team if there's any issues and then we eventually changed it to Matt informed Dan Hadaway and this is that goal that's you know this is that that task that started off as an objective I don't know if you remember this early in the webinar when we did the teaser uh, but started off as an objective and then it turned into a monthly regular duty so um, so the meeting category is really kind of where we do the goals review, you know, and and so in a typical bank, you might have the incident response team in here. You probably have your IT steering committee or the EDP committee, whatever you're calling that particular team. You might have the board in here for the stuff that needs to go to board, the annual report to the board. Maybe that's, you know, let's, let's just kind of look and see what our examples listed. I did notice the board in here. And so there's just one thing we put in there. But yeah, the vendor due diligence report, that goes to the board. The annual report to the board could also be in there. Um, the GLBA risk assessment could be in here. Um, you know, you follow how this is just a set of examples. It's no, by no means meant to be what you would actually start off with um, in your opening CMS. And then finally, we really stress, don't forget dates. We have it right in the you know, description here. But as we review the goals, if we want to get credit for the goals review, we have to put some kind of a comment in the description. Um, and just so you know, our, our CMS actually has like three archived you know, columns to the right of the active description because we wanted to keep our, our row height to a manageable size, right? Um, but every time we review the goal, we should probably be talking about what we're doing, maybe with the exception of our weekly goals. Maybe then we only highlight any kind of big issues that come out or even monthly, you know, you know maybe it's just, you know, you might not see something every month. I mean, if we look at this example here, you know, there wasn't something every month, but there was something every time there was a change. This is what you're going to show to your auditors, right? This is what your auditors are going to look at in terms of the answers to those audit questions that I Hope you remember me bringing up just a few minutes ago where, you know, when the question is, you know, are you making sure that somebody is checking those Google alerts? The answer should be yes. Really? How are you doing that? Well, we do it in the CMS. Do you document that you're making? Yes, we do in the CMS. You follow what I'm saying? And and just because we don't write down every month we're checking that Matt's doing it, we can we, we can assume that we are because we're saying monthly here. Now, if you get an auditor who wants you to write it down every month, you know, well, your auditor's probably for some other reason feeling like you're not doing a good job of documentation. Um, and then, you know, this is going to evolve in terms of how your team uses it. And one of the things that I've kind of noticed is that our tech team is using our CMS a little bit different than our MTM uh, which is using it a little bit different than the NOC team, which is using it a little bit, you know, so so everybody ends up engaging with this within their own methodology. And that's why we took this, we started writing instructions because this is where we're actually controlling where we don't want people to, to use their own methodology. So we want to make sure everybody's using it a certain way. And so let's just kind of zoom in here. And, um, you know, I, I think 150 is probably good enough. And, and it just needs to remind me what I want to, you know, go over with you. And so we just added this, this movie isn't available yet, but at the end of the, you know, program, we'll let you know, hey, you can go out to movies.infotext.com if you want to refer to this movie um, when you're showing your team how to bring up, um, you know, the change management spreadsheet. Um, always, always, always use, you know, dates in the description field. And so, you know, what we're really saying here is that whenever you add something in here, you're going to regret it if you don't use the date because the next time you check it, you're going to be like, gosh, when did that happen or whatever, right? Our auditors want to see when we're doing stuff. Um, so always use dates in the description field. Uh, one of the things we've kind of adopted at Infotex as a general rule of thumb, if something's going to take less than six minutes, and, you know, in your bank you can say five minutes, we say six minutes because we track all of our time um, in decimals, you know, in, in, in tenths of an hour. And so one-tenth of an hour, point one of an hour is six minutes. And so if something's going to take less than six minutes, just do it. 
Don't don't track it. Don't 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 put it on a list somewhere. Just get it done. Okay. Um, a lot easier said than done, of course. Um, but if it's going to take less than a week, let's not put it in the CMS. Why are we doing that? We're just wasting time putting it in the CMF if it's going to take less than a week to achieve. Um, if it's going to take a month or less and it doesn't involve anybody, then maybe we consider putting it in here because we're worried we're going to forget to do it. But most Often, if something's going to take less than a month, we're not going to clutter up the CMS with it because, gosh, it's only going to go through at most one review cycle. Now, if we promised it and we said we'd do it in less than a month and then something came up and it could, it's going to take us more than a month, then by golly, we better get it in the CMS or everybody's going to say, that, hey, you didn't follow the right procedure to say you couldn't get it done. Um, meanwhile, if there's anything that takes more than a week that involves several people, we should consider putting it in here. All right, makes sense? Um, because it involves several people, and so we want to take advantage of the, you know, the opportunity to coordinate the goal. Makes sense? So, um, And so that's kind of our general rule of thumb. We're always breaking that. And when we say general rule of thumb here, what we mean is that, but it can be broken if you have a good reason. Um, closing tasks. So, one of the very nice things about the CMS is it gives us the ability or to change management spreadsheet. I'm in the habit of calling it a CMS, but it gives us the ability to close out objectives. So I'm just going to kind of, you know, sort down. To, I don't know how many we closed here, but um, it doesn't look like we got a lot closed, but we did close a few. Closing tasks, by the way, should be done in a meeting. It shouldn't be done by the ISO getting ready for a meeting. The, the, everybody in the meeting has to agree that we can close the, the task. So, um, by the way, I'm not sure if we talk about retired tasks, uh, but there are regular duties that um, from time to time are no longer necessary. Um, and, and this is great because this is where I'm going next. So, retired regular duties is basically, all right, here's, I, we put this in as a fake example, but remember when we had to test our modems? Well, we don't have to do that anymore. So <clears throat> if that was a monthly thing that we did by August 1st of 2010, we don't have any modems anymore. We're going to retire that. We want to keep it in our documentation in case an auditor ever asks about it, but we're going to retire it so we you know, can get it out of there. We don't have to review it anymore. Makes sense. We're going to keep the priority the same we, so we know that, hey, it was an A priority. It related to safety, et cetera, et cetera. While we're here, I might as well go ahead and look at the KISS stuff and the redundant stuff as well. What ends up happening on a regular basis is that, especially in Infotex, but uh, Dan will come up with a really good idea, and after a couple of months, we'll realize, you know what, this is a C priority, and then maybe later, or you know, like in the case of this one, it's like, hey, we're having a hard time figuring out what strategy statement this one aligns to. Um, in this case, let's get the IT steering committee to agree that we're no longer going to consider this to be a priority or an objective. You know, in this case, you know, it's your classic, the... The president went to a conference and wants us to look into installing Alexis in the boardroom, right? And so, you know, we really didn't want to do it anyway, but we put it in a CMS so that we can, you know, give a, a real uh, an analysis and investigation to it. But, you know, we just didn't get to it. And finally, we talked to IT steering committee into, into dropping it as a goal. When we did that, we changed it to KISS and we had documented that we kissed it. Um, keep it simple to succeed is what I say KISS means, not keep it simple. Stupid, keep it simple to succeed. Um, and then this happens a lot where we all of a sudden realize, hey, didn't we just discuss this, you know, 10 minutes ago? It's a redundant priority. And so we mark one of them as redundant. What we'll usually do is we'll copy the active district description into the one we choose to be the goal that we're keeping in our tracking system uh, so that we, you know, have a nice good, you know, solid paper trail. Um, and so anyway, I hope that that kind of helps you understand a little bit, you know, and kind of get you thinking a little bit about how the management of this actually pans out. So um, I'm going to kind of go back up to the top here again and just keep walking through the instructions here. The check date is the scheduled meeting uh, that we will review the, you know, particular task in. And what I, what I want to also say about this is very often we'll be like, hey, let's move this back. Sorry, wrong place. You know, so we might be looking at this goal, you know, the website check. Actually, this is a good one. We, we have an annual regular duty where we go out, we check every, you know, corner of our website to make sure that it's, uh, 
uh, working properly and that sort of thing. And, and we actually bring it up in Chrome and Internet Explorer and Firefox and, you know, whatever browsers we're, you know, wanting to make sure can view our website. And, and this year we did that. But instead of closing it, and, and, and by the way, an annual regular duty, when we close an annual regular duty, you know, so let's just say this is annual. I mean, it wouldn't be something we do weekly, I don't think, but really wouldn't be done by, well, I mean, it could be done by the ISO, but probably more done by some marketing person, right? And then if the marketing person sees a problem, then they're probably going to want to inform the, you know, if it's in here, it needs to, it's because we want to watch it from a governance perspective. So they need to inform probably the IT steering committee or something, right? Um, so maybe, you know, on, on September 9th, we're checking this. And what happened with ours is we're like, hey, you know what? This is great. We got this done, but let's add to the scope because at Infotex, we use a lot of aliases. I don't know if you've noticed, but movies.infotex.com, webinars.infotex.com, right? And so we decided to add checking those aliases to the process. And so we end up, you know, over here, we would have said, you know, something like, you know, on the 9th, I think it was, um, you know, we're adding checking aliases to the process and then we listed the ones we want checked there's a lot more in this by the way we use a lot of aliases here but you get the point um, and then we move this back a week you know again this is an annual thing so oh and for the annual regular duties we you know we we do it every July I think right if, it, if it's coming up in September, then we must have did it every August. And so, so when we originally, you know, moved this back, right, we moved it back to August of 2019 when we were looking at it in August of 2018 and closing it as a regular duty, which is what I meant to say is that whenever we close something as a regular duty, we move it back to whatever the next period is. Well, and since it's an annual one, <clears throat> we'd want to, you know, track the, uh, you know, the, the completion dates, right? And so let's say in August 2018, we did it. In September of 2019, we did it. But then we moved it back to the next week. We moved it back to nine, uh, what's seven plus nine, what's 16, you're right? So, so and then let's pretend it's the next week. And so we go here and we're like, yes, we added that to the process. Sophia reported it was done. And so we'll go ahead and, and put in 916. And we can, you know, if somebody's like, why well, you have two and 19? Well, we can go over here and look and we can see, you know, we'd have to, you know, comment it here, 916, done with new aliases checked as well. Makes sense. And then we come over here and then we would close it as a regular duty by moving it to 20. And what actually what we do, because so we don't have to keep track of the dates, is we move it to 2020 dash 08. It's something we do every August. Then at the beginning of the year, we apply the dates for everything in 2020, which is, by the way, an annual regular duty in our CMS, which I would think we call it the switch. Um, and so we're switching from 2019 to 2020 on our dates. And so, and by the way, we do it all at one time. You might think, well, are you sure you aren't in November putting dates on January? No, because in November, we're finishing our... Uh, technology plan in December we're budgeting for it by January we know exactly what we're doing we go through and do that because we're whittling out the stuff that's no longer applicable to our strategy statements um, our strategy statements are a little more granular than what I'm showing you here today and so that's how we close a regular duty we move it to the next year uh, moving along here um, we, we, and you have to populate every field. Um, if there's, you know, um, one of the things that I know that the NAC team does at the end of their meeting is they, as they filter down the blanks because, you know, a couple people have complained to them that they're not populating every field. Right. And so, um, so now every field's populated to make things work a lot better. Now we might not have the answer to every field or not every field may apply. And that's why you'll see, you know, I don't know where, but you know, this should always apply, but you know, the, like for an example, the last completion date, you know what I mean? And a, maybe there is no, you know, there's a lot, let's kind of sort down to that and just kind of see what the example said in terms of, you know, so there, so, so these objectives don't have a, um, a last completion date. And, and in this case, I think it was because we haven't got it done yet. Well, you know, so we use whip for that now. 
that, so that that makes sense. Now these daily, these are daily regular duties. They wouldn't be in here, just so you know. Um, what would actually be in here for this? Review the IDS reports. That is something that needs to happen every day, right? But the, what what I would because we're not going to check the CMS every day, right? But maybe once a month, we review. Uh, we are reviewing the IDS reports or something like that. You know, you know what I'm saying? So so we might have monthly regular duties or quarterly regular duties to check to make sure that our daily and our weekly regular duties are being done properly, but we're not going to track daily regular duties, et cetera, in the cycle. So again, keep in mind, I had somebody set up these examples just by grabbing them and cutting and pasting from you know other stuff, sanitizing it, not that sort of thing. Um, and so they didn't know that we would never have daily as a cycle in here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and change this monthly now just so that we don't have to come across that explanation again, right? Um, but but anyway, the point being if, is, is if there's blanks in here, especially in like the deadline, you know what I mean, under the due date. Now, we do put, we want people to put pending, but usually what happens is that we'll say, hey, give us the pending, give us the blanks, and then we'll usually put the, you know, pending in the blanks if they're, you know, if they apply, um, but this is where we say, oh, so they're wanting us to investigate two-factor authentication on bill pay, huh? Well, who's that being assigned? Oh, thank gosh, it's the electronic banking team, not the ISO or whatever. You follow what I'm saying? And so um, so anyway, that pending really ends up becoming a pretty good little tool there. Look for unpopulated fields during the goals review. Well, that, you know, that's kind of, that's what I just kind of got done explaining. Monday's dates. Oh, okay, I just... Um, this is just kind of a reminder of everybody that, you know, these are Monday's dates. We, we update them and just so you know, I mean, we start, we, we keep the last, um, review dates as well, but this makes it easier for you to know the next chat date. So, you know, most of, most banks are now going to where, you know, the steering committee meetings the second Tuesday of every month. And so you'd know, well, that's on September 17th. So anything that goes to the IT steering committee, the next check date would be September 17th. Um, not September 16th, which is a Monday, right? Um, and so that's what the you know that's what this is up here for. Uh, the far left column number again that represents the order that the task was entered into the CMS. And so I'm I'm always fascinated you know by that in the Infotech CMS. I can always go back. We started doing ours. I, I think it was 2007. Um, but but I know that I know the name of the bank. I know the exact project. Um, this the first task we put under our CMS, and and when we decided to do this, we we're actually using uh, an application called SysAid, um, which wasn't a bad application, but it wasn't meant to to do this. It was a change management application, or at least we bought it thinking it was a change management application, but we found this to be much much easier to use and much simpler than SysAid in terms of change management. So, and I think that was about 2007. Um, Identify tactics from the tactical plan um, in the priority. And so so what we're basically saying there uh, is, you know, if we look at our examples here, is that, uh, you know, we have A, B, and C priorities. All regular duties should be an A priority unless programmatically we've said this one's a B priority, meaning that if you need to, you know, to dump one of your regular duties, this was, you know, this is one that we don't care you get to every month, but don't go more than two months without doing it or something. You know, I mean, that I can see that um, as as kind of a methodology. And by the way, if if we made a decision about that formally, maybe we'd add that into the instructions here. That's this is where we're keeping track of all of our guidelines. Right. I mean, if you if you if you think about how we're how we're tracking all of this. We want as much uniformity as we can get, the, the more powerful this is, right? But we identify our arete goals. We identify original tactics. So in January, you know, we might say our strategy is to, and let me think of our strategy, you know, for this year. One of our strategies was, uh, we, our strategy statement was uh, implement SEAM 3.0, and I'm, I'm simplifying that, right? Um, but then maybe there's like five tactics we wanted to do, um, uh, tactic A, tactic B, tactic C. Well, we would identify those as tactics here. So it's easier for us to remember, hey, you know, this was the original, um, what we said we needed to do in order to achieve our strategy. So, you know, before we go lower in the priority on this one, we darn well better get with the IT steering committee as an example. Um, but you follow how that kind of identifies 
These were our original plans. Now, we might have crystallized a particular tactic into several sub-tactics or other tasks that are in this CMS. And if we can, if we can you know, um, prioritize those as tactics as well, now it makes us easier to know that, you know, and, and, and really what, what is kind of interesting is that you can actually bring up, you know, next time you go in the steering committee, you can say, hey, I don't know if you guys realize this, but at the beginning of the year, we had, you know, 100 tactics and, and now we still have those 100 tactics, but we have, you know, 200 tasks associated with those 100 tactics. And we have 300 objectives in our CMS. Those other 100 objectives were not part of the plan when we started the year. That's why we're falling behind on everything. You need to stop bringing new stuff to us other than in October when we're asking you, what you want us to add into our tactical plan for next year. And that sort of thing <clears throat> comes out of the CMS. And then likewise, um, we can also identify our ARETE goals. In other words, what are the top things we want to work on? They're, they're even higher priority than tactics. A lot of them are regular duties that we're just wanting to focus in on. You know, we talked about how vendor due diligence could be an arete goal if you know we're tired of getting slapped in audits or whatever you know vulnerability management is one of the you know uh things we talked about you know in in the powerpoint part of this presentation and so you can see here that that you know we're proposing this particular bank you know make them arete goals it's still something we do weekly and monthly but we're going to keep in mind that hey this is the, out of everything that we're doing. What we do at the beginning of the year is we identify, again, you know, three personal arete goals for everybody. But then we also identify seven arete goals for the whole company. And, and they would get put in here as well as arete goals. Always, 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 always assign a deadline or use pending. We already kind of talked about that. Um, if we filter to pending, we can see where the potential upcoming curveballs are. It's a great awareness activity. Um, always document why we're changing a priority. Always document why we're changing a deadline, right? And that's done in the description section of the, uh, of the CMS. And then finally, in the last completion date for regular duties, you know, if, they, if they're over a month, bi-monthly, quarterly, or whatever, we want a date, all right? If they're under monthly, then just put the cycle. And then if they're monthly, it's up to whoever's running the meeting, the chair of the meeting's discretion at least in our company so i feel like i've covered everything i wanted to cover with this uh, change management spreadsheet i i'm sure this webinar is running long uh, so let's go back to the powerpoint presentation but i hope that helps you kind of get started on developing your own simplified change management program and really i hope this gets you thinking in terms of whether or not you want to implement this implement this simplified methodology Hey Dan, I just wanted to remind you and everybody else that the movie and Buller Plates will be available at the link shown. Uh, Michael and or Sophia should have sent those boilerplates to you by now. Uh, please know that if you're watching the movie version of this webinar and you're a client, we would be happy to provide all of the boilerplates, any boilerplates you see. Any, any boilerplates we have are yours for free. Um, if you're not a client, well, you know, just reach out to us at info at infotext.com and we'll see what we can do. Michael, I'm, I'm finished with the webinars. Has there been any questions? No? Okay. Well, hey, I'm turning control over to you, so take it away, buddy. Uh, thank you, Dan, as always. For an archive of all of our training movies, please go to movies.infotext.com. Thank you for joining us today.